we're going to be looking at, at Jacob's difficulties, Yaakov's difficulties, um, and how to actually respond to those difficulties and learn from his lesson. I would like uh, to basically title this lecture, The Purpose Behind the Test. Um, I re remember, and I, Loretta knows too, and I think other people, I think Moshe has been on a treadmill test. And they take you and put it on a treadmill, and they have you run as fast as you possibly can at the longest speed. And I was always under the impression that the treadmill was, the purpose was to see how long you could run, or, you know, how fast you could run, or whatever. And it's none of those, actually. Actually, the test for the treadmill is after you get off. It's to find how quickly your heart rate returns back to normal, uh, and what your blood pressure and all that looks like. It's after the test, or after the running, is, is really the, the purpose of the test. It's not running on the treadmill, it's the fact that the results that it produces. And so what we learned from uh, the sages of blessed memory, that uh, Avraham has ten tests. Pierre Chabot lists the ten tests of uh, uh, Avraham Avinu. And these tests are very, uh, you know, very distinct and laid out. We talked about them several weeks ago during the lecture. But Yaakov has seemingly much more tests than his predecessor and grandfather, his, his, his father, grandfather and father, to say that, uh, struggled with so many difficult things, yet maintained a level of dignity throughout his whole experience. We talked about this in the last class, how to deal uh, with with business when it gets brutal, and we learned that Yaakov had sort of a, a disposition toward bad things happening. He just knew how to focus. Well, from that, um, we, I've developed out some ideas that I've, I've been reading through that help us to learn not only there's a purpose behind the test, but there is also a way to go through that test with much more meaning and understanding. There's a phrase that is coined in Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, verse 7. It talks about in this time, talking about the day of, of uh, it, the day of redemption or the right before the Messianic era, that there would be a trouble that comes to Jacob, and it means there not the man Jacob, but the people Jacob, which would be the Jewish people. It says that it will be more momentous than any other time. For Jacob, it'll be, and, and, and it's been sort of coined as Jacob's trouble. We've heard that, that term before. And this time of trouble is, I, I, I'm actually thinking we've already entered into this time of trouble. When you have the King of Jordan stand up and say that we have entered into World War, World War III, it's pretty serious business. If he says, the trouble is with Islam, it's within Islam, we are having a struggle within Islam. We know that prophecy, and we'll break down the path a little bit to the Navims, the prophets, that the prophets talk about a time of very difficult trouble for the nations, and that he would bring Ishmael down, that the, the destruction of Ishmael would take place between a battle between the Ishmaelites and Eden, which would be the, the West. And it is during that time that God promises from Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, verse 7 through like 15, He promises that during this most difficult time, though it would be trying for you, God says, I'll bring you through this. I'll take you out of this thing. And it's referred to as Jacob's trouble because we go back to the life of Jacob and we look and we go, wow, how can one man endure so many negative things? Let's just enumerate just a few of them before we get rolling. First, the struggle for the covenant. That was a big struggle. The threat in his life from his brother. Having to be exiled. Sounds familiar. Sounds like a pattern for the Jewish people, having to be exiled. He goes to, to his future father-in-law's house, and there he's, he's um, uh, ten times financially swindled by his father-in-law up to a hundred times of negative things that took place between him and his father-in-law. Struggle after struggle after struggle. Then he leaves, he escapes in the night, only to find out that 
his wife before they get into the land dies. So here he has all these children. One of his wife is alive, and one he beloved dies. Such great tribulation. But when I look through it, I realize that he maintained a level of dignity and service to God that is uh, compared to, to no other. Most people who go through that level of difficulty, uh, it ends up breaking them down. It ends up tearing them down, and they're just a shell of a person. And yet, he continued such a high level of devotion to God. So much so, it said, that when he was to return, he remember he made a vow to God, and he says, I will make this a house of prayer, right? That place where he was at. So almost vowing to build the Beis HaKmikdash before it was even commanded to be built. Think about the level of devotion that I'm going to make this place a house of prayer. I will dedicate my life to you. He says, you are my God. You are the Lord my God. Dedicate himself. The story of, of Yaakov uh, portrayed in this parsha has always been seen by the commentators to Torah uh, as being a matrix of the life of the Jewish people. Centuries of exile, difficulties, um, and, and we see, even in truth, that the first words of the Parsha, Vayetze, illustrates much of the Jewish history in, the, in exile. Jews are constantly on the move, restless, nervous, even when Jews find themselves seemingly comfortably ensconced within a general society, they notoriously and easily find themselves in an upheaval and turned over upside down. It was just a few months ago that Jews in France, very comfortable, wasn't interested in returning to the land, all of a sudden found themselves uh, uprooted by a bayonet from uh, Islamic terrorist. And even in the land, uh, we see that um, uh, Arabs killing uh, people in the street has caused such upheaval. What is the purpose behind it? Why do we have to endure so much difficulties? We look at the Jews in Spain. 800 years ago in each uh, Central and Eastern Europe for almost a thousand years, but eventually their stay in those areas came to an end. It seemed like that it was going to work. We could live here three or four hundred years and maybe we could make it along, and it isn't long before the society, general society, turns against them. But Yetzi has haunted the Jewish existence for millennium. The ground under Jewish feet has always ensured uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty. Uh, and uh, the condition of, the, of Jewish life seemed to be without serious stability. But it is only in the land that God promises peace for the Jewish people, that if you will dwell in the land, I will give you peace. But even in the land and having a nation of their own, they still are having a difficult time with peace. What is the purpose behind the test? It is interesting to note that that the rabbis of the Mishnah list ten challenges, as I said, about Abraham. So much is said about it. They made so much of this list of ten challenges, even go as far as saying most people will endure at least ten type of challenges. But if we re look really close to the Jewish people, they, they, they more uh, readily connect to Yaakov. Even those people within the nations who have left their past to embrace Torah Judaism, either through conversion or becoming B'nai Noach, they too begin to find that suffering is a norm in their life. Whatever it may be, the rejection of people, your own personal exile from family members, even maybe struggles in health, etc. But you discover in this process that there is actually meaning behind suffering. And you learn that there is a tool here that Hashem, He has you on a treadmill, you're running, and you feel like your chest is going to explode, but that isn't the test. The actual struggle isn't the test. The test is how you will respond to it in the end. What will be the outcome of the test? You think of Rachel's barrenness and then her tragic death. I mean, I just I have a daughter. I have daughter-in-laws. I couldn't imagine them going through all of the years of not being able to have a child, and then when she has a child, she dies. It's amazing that this holy man maintained his dignity. Even after this, this struggle with Esau, having to run and be, out, be in exile, 
Yaakov now knows he has to return and face his brother again and realizing that now I have a test that I'm not sure that my family can survive that test. I mean, he was very serious about the safety of his family. He wasn't sure of the outcome. There are several explanations in the Jewish tradition for the purpose of suffering. And for each one of these explanations, rabbis have, have provided proof text and reason from Scripture. One explanation is that suffering has been a punishment for a person, right? You've done some sin in your life and you need to go through punishment. The other is uh, that says that, that um, the suffering that you endure is not punishment, but it's refinement. It's, it's bringing about difficulties. We have to understand that uh, there is also a, a, a mindset out there that God doesn't allow difficulties to happen to you, that difficulties are from some other source. But you and I both know that that's limiting the Creator because Hashem is not, He is God. So that means that our suffering, if it has meaning, then we must trust that Hashem, who is all good, has a purpose behind our suffering and difficulties. There is a statement that comes from Pierre Kavod. I would like to, to read this. It says, a true student of Torah carries on, the study, uh, on study and despite whatever sufferings or hardships they come into. Meaning that a person who, who focuses their life in service to Hashem is not set aside by their suffering. But at the same time, I am speaking these words. There are individuals that their difficulties of life, uh, it is almost uh, impossible to hold on to that level of focus. And so there has to be some type of advice that we get that will allow us to learn from the patriarchs. Here's another thing that says in Pierre Kavot 6.4, it says, this is the way of Torah. When we talked about what is Torah, as a student of Torah carries out studies despite whatever sufferings and hardship come about, and then it says, this is the way of Torah. Eat bread with salt, drink water in small measure, sleep, live a life of deprivation, but toil in Torah. If you do this, you are praiseworthy in this world as well as the world to come. So if our toil is going to be in anything, our toil should be in the connection that we have with the Creator. That means that suffering gives us the opportunity to refine our connection with God. That's what it's about. That is why we have those difficult times. I've, I've said to my wife many times, I used to suffer with tremendous migraine headaches. I mean, really bad. And it would humble me so much and put me in check in so many different ways that when the headache would be gone, I felt closer to God. I can't explain it to you. But to have that level of pain humbles you. And whenever we go through difficult times, what we find in Yaakov is it had the effect of bringing him closer to Hashem. It is Yaakov that not only is able to figure out that the house of prayer, that he could actually at the highest level of meditation actually almost ascend up this spiritual ladder. He was capable of doing that, but not only that was but he was capable upon returning back to the land to engage in that level of meditation to wrestle with Esau's angel. Now think about this. This man was really connected. So a guy that has gone through so much suffering also has to have, also is going to be a person, if that suffering is implemented properly, can be a person with the much more refined connection to the Creator. And that is the difference. So if you say, well, Rod, what is the purpose behind the test? The purpose behind the test is to create an environment for you to have a refined connection to God. That's it. Now, there are some people, I, I love this statement, it says that a, a potter, they talked about potters in, in the ancient world that would whack their pottery with a stick to prove that it wasn't breakable. And someone says, well, they're not a fool. They don't whack the pots that are weak. They only whack the pots that are strong. What does that mean? It means that God only brings to us the difficulties for those who are capable of handling it that, that are also people that will need 
to bring a special light to the world. A special light to the world because that person draws closer to the Creator. There is a book that I will quote some quotes from in just a moment, and it's called um, it's called uh, Living with God, uh, 30 Days of uh, uh, Fulfilled Life. It's actually a free ebook that you can get. I want to go through and look at some strategies to overcome um, difficulties. When I say overcome them, I'm not talking about avoiding them, okay? Because you can't avoid it. It's the whole purpose behind the struggle is learning how to make it through it with the highest level of dignity. First, number one, make a game plan. First thing, whenever you feel that difficulties have come on, make a game plan. What did Yaakov do as soon as his father-in-law said, well, look, I'll let you go, but I'll, I'll, you, you can have the other daughter, but you have to work for me for a longer period of time. Now, when Yaakov realized he wasn't getting paid, he came up with a game plan, right? He didn't lose his head. The, the, the idea of getting or making a game plan is to try to get outside input about what's going on. You need to get righteous input about what's happening and to seek a sage, a tzaddik. Ask your rabbi, talk to someone, get close to them, find out what you can do. Um, focus especially on the next step you will take to address the issue itself. Focus. Don't lose your head. It is important that during this time of challenge that you have to maintain a level of optimism. One of the things that we often do when trouble comes is immediately begin to feel as if there's no solution. And if there's no solution, this is never going to go away. And if it's never going to, you understand, it just piles up on you. In, include in your game plan ways to use the challenge as a catalyst to growth. First, you have to say, there's a reason I can actually grow from this. If you think of athletes, how do they grow physically? They challenge, they break down their body. How does a bodybuilder build bigger muscle? He tears and rips his muscles apart to do that. I mean, it sounds like a terrible, painful thing, but that's how muscle growth comes. Periodically review your plan to see uh, if it is actually working for you. We, I love the, the, the saying that says, you know, that said, well, see that you've been doing this for most of your life. Now, how is that working for you? Because you look back and you go, that. What I've normally done is just not working. At the same time, accept that your challenges are given to you by a loving God for your benefit and that you will grow from it. If I automatically assume the difficulties and tribulations that I uh, occur is, is random, useless, and without power to transform, I've missed the whole big picture. I said earlier, keep a cool head. That's point two. When de dealing with difficulties, it's important to, to keep patient, uh, maintain patience. Uh, we've talked about, uh, the Ramchal talks about having um, zeal with no watchfulness is, is a very dangerous thing. And um, making, what do you call it, knee-jerk reactions to your circumstances is most definitely not good. Uh, as a matter of fact, Desperate measures will tend to drain you emotionally and psychologically. It even can compound the problem, not make it better. Next, number three, forgive. We often blame others or ourselves for our problems, and this only exasperate, exasperates the, the pain and the, and the struggle. Yaakov didn't blame his father-in-law with anything. He just dealt with it and drove on. Next. Avoid dwelling on the problem. Now, this is the hard one here, guys. How do you avoid dwelling on it when it's always in your face? This is difficult. Often, what wears us down the most is not the actual problem, but the constant thinking about the problem and spending our days and nights consumed with the issue. Have a time set aside that you deal with that. Say, so, okay, from, from this time to this time, don't do it before you go to bed. From this time to this time, I'm going to sit and meditate on, on how to work myself through this issue. Also, doing copious amounts of prayer during this time is very helpful. Uh, with that set time, in addition, have that set time when, when, uh, uh, when you express your pain either to God or a family member, your husband, your wife. If you're having difficulties, a good friend, 
sit down and say, I need to talk about this. One of the worst things that we do, uh, especially in our society of trying to keep up a good appearance and reputation, you don't want to open up to somebody and go, look, I'm really having a difficult time with this. It's important to share those things. Number five, don't forget to live life. Jacob continued on. He had children. In the midst of all of that difficult time he was having with Laban, he had children, he had wives, he had success. He was becoming wealthy. He didn't curl up in the fetal position and start bemoaning the fact that, that, that everybody was against him. He was living life. Uh, don't put your life on hold because of problems. If anything, you probably need to uh, expedite your life. Begin to enjoy life. Give yourself permission to enjoy your children, your, your family, your associates. Many times when we start having problems, what's the first thing that we want to do? What's the natural response? Withdraw. It's the first thing we want to do. And look, we're all guilty of it. Don't, don't get me wrong. We all just want to go, uh, I don't want to answer my phone. I ain't answer no text messages. I don't want to talk to anybody. That is actually the worst thing that you can do. It's good to, if you're having a situation like that, call up a dear friend and say, hey, can we have coffee? Let's, let's go hang out a little bit. Uh, the next thing, we've heard this over and over, but I must mention it. If you want your problems to be uh, less important in your mind and you're trying to live life, help others, serve others. And if you will do that, you will find that your struggles become uh, less important. And there's a tremendous mitzvah in serving others and helping others. But at the same time, it helps to get our minds off of our own difficulties. Number seven, focus on what's right. Focus on what's right. These are principles that are, are timeless. When dealing with an issue, our tendency is to hyper-focus on that one situation. And it makes it really difficult to actually back off and think uh, sort of logically about it. Sometimes you, we've heard the phrase, I can't see the tree because of the forest. And it's so easy to get just blindsided by the, 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 this incredible smoke screen that, that we get focused in on. And the way we the way we sort of reframe things is begin to focus on what is right. Look at what things, you know, half the time that we, we, we come to an issue, if you just think about for a moment, what is going on that's good? Right? What is good in my life right now? You realize all of a sudden that there are more good things than there are bad things. Right? It's just this one problem is like, uh, I love this, the, the saying that says that a, um, a three by five card can block out the whole sun. And that's exactly what problems do. You put, you, you, it's, it's a matter of perspective. If I hold the three by five card right in front of my face, it will block out the sun. Same goes with our problems. Take, remove, remove that blockage, begin to help others, and really appreciate your, your, uh, the, the life that you have. Number eight, realize that everyone has difficulties. Everybody has difficulties. Everybody experiences death. Everybody argues with their spouse. Everybody, let's think of a few more things. Uh, everybody has health problems. What else? Everybody has, especially if you work in the world, you have somebody that's going to misunderstand you and misinterpret your life and give you a hard time. And when that happens, we have to realize there's a priority here. And these things are not to destroy me, but to make me better. Often we compare ourselves, especially because of Facebook and, and uh, social media, that everybody else's life is just peachy, right? The, wow, they, they're doing so well. They're doing so good. You don't realize how miserable they are as well. And at the same time, we're fools if we think that everybody's not dealing with the same thing. And no matter how much money you have, you still have the same problems. If anything, it's worse, I think, when you have all the money in the world because then you realize money can't solve your problems. That the only thing that can solve problems is what's between the ears. And some people, it takes a long time to figure that one out. Next, very important, number nine, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Don't overextend yourself. Many times we become consumed with our own difficulties that we neglect our health. 
don't neglect your health. If anything, that's the time that you need to really hyper-focus on eating right, exercising. Do things to help you feel good about yourself. You know, I, I know that we talk about shop therapy, shopping therapy. You all, none of you guys do that. Okay. Anyway, shopping therapy. Sometimes when you're feeling a little blue, it's fun to go out and buy something. Right? It's, it's an emotional high. You tell you're taking care of yourself. Now, you don't want to be irresponsible and go buy a you know, $90,000 Mercedes unless you have that kind of money. Or, but, but I'm talking about reasonable things. Take care of yourself. Um, set clear boundaries also. Um, with other people in your life during this time, it's very important. For example, if you're not, um, if you are caring for a child, a spouse, or a parent uh, who is in the hospital, uh, decide how many days a week you can go. Now, my wife is one of these people that constantly wants to do things for people, and I, I appreciate that about her. But at the same time, there's a limit. You can only do so much, and so I have to be the one to go, you know, it's actually all right. You don't really have to, like, every day, and she will check on them every day, send them email, making a phone call, and sometimes if you're not careful, you can over overextend yourself. You have to keep things in balance. Last but not least is... Um, Something like um, a previous suggestion was ask for help. First, obviously, our help should come from God. That no, nothing in the world can help us like the Creator of the universe. There's something powerful about hit but do personal prayer in which you unburden yourself and you express your frustrations. This is what's so great about Abba. He's our Father, right? He's not upset by your, your, you being upset. And it's all right to complain. It's all right to kvetch a little bit to the Creator and go, you know, this doesn't seem right. You've got to help me look through this. I have to understand it. You have to give me wisdom. It's nothing wrong with that. It's very important. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, especially since we're living in a very observant uh, community, it's all right to lean on somebody else and ask them for help. Especially we have such great men and women of wisdom, it's very easy to do that. And I know that each one of you have at some level done that for each other. And it's a huge, it's a huge uh, lift of a burden. Um, there are, and I'm going to wrap up with this, there are purposes behind the test. And we understand the purpose is for personal refinement. Even though we can't seem to find a good reason why it's there. Obviously, there are tests that some people endure because they're stupid. We're not talking about that. We're talking about tests that come upon people just because they're tests, right? Things that you didn't plan for that happens in your life. When that happens, immediately shift into the gear of, of what I call, you know, the Jacob uh, my mentality and go, okay, I'm here. I'm in this situation. I'm in it for 20 years. So I'm going to have to deal with this. I'm going to come out better than what I went into this thing. And that's the whole purpose of the test. I might feel like my chest is going to explode on the treadmill, but the test is getting off the treadmill and finally sitting down to where my heart can go back to, to normal and to be told things look good. Okay, you're doing well. And so sometimes when you're on that treadmill of life looking at difficulties and wondering how you're going to stay up, know that you're not going to be destroyed or hurt. One of the nice things about doing a treadmill test at the hospital is you know they're not going to let you have a cardiac arrest on the treadmill, even though you feel like you're getting ready to have one, right? So uh, we've learned such great lessons from uh, Yaakov, and we've learned how to take these tests and actually turn them into a great benefit for our life. That concludes the sure, the lecture. If there's any comments.